أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله الحمد لله الذي أنزل الفرقان على عبده ليكون للعالمين نذيرا والصلاة والسلام على خير خلق ونور عرش أفضل الأنبياء والمرسلين حبيبنا وسيدنا وسندنا وشفيعنا ومولانا أبي القاسم محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين المأسمين المظلومين أما بعد فقد قال الله سبحانه وتعالى في كتاب المجيد وقوله الحق وهو أصدق الصادقين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم فاذكروني أذكركم واشكروا لي ولا تكفرون يا أيها الذين آمنوا استعينوا بالصبر والصلاة إن الله مع الصابرين ولا تقول لمن يقتل في سبيل الله أموات بل أحياء ولكن لا تشعرون ولنبلونكم بشيء من الخوف والجوع ونقص من الأموال والأنفس والثمرات وبشر الصابرين الذين إذا أصابتهم مصيبة قالوا إنا لله وإنا إليه راجعون أولئك عليهم صلوات من ربهم ورحمة وأولئك هم المهتدون صدق الله العلي العظيم صلوات على محمد وآل محمد I praise Allah and I begin in His blessed name on this very, very holy night. Sad, tragic, yet momentous and powerful. The source, the engine, the spirit of the real revolution of La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. We send salams to our blessed Imam Hussein alayhi salatu wasalam and his family together. Assalamu alayka ya Aba Abdullah. وعلى الأرواح التي حلت بفنائك عليكم مني سلام الله أبدا ما بقيت وبقي الليل والنهار ولا جعل الله آخر العهد مني لزيارتكم We pray that we visit him We visit him We go see his shrine We go feel the spirit of the shuhada of Karbala والسلام على الحسين وعلى علي بن الحسين وعلى أولاد الحسين وعلى أصحاب الحسين خصوصا سيدي ومولاي أبا الفضل العباس وأختك زينب وبنتك رقية جميعا شهداء كربلاء ورحمة الله وبركاته صلوة الله محمد وآل محمد On this night, 1,380 years ago, 1,380 lunar years ago, 61 AH, Imam Hussain wasalam, was cornered on the land called Karbala, His original name was Nainawa. He was cornered because the enemy forces wants to obfuscate wants to obliterate, wants to annihilate, wants to wipe off the religion of God on earth. And Imam Hussain alayhi salam, who's the Khalifatullah, that Allah commanded, will rise and stand. And under any circumstance that is brought forth towards them, they will be indomitable, intrepid as we say, strong, vigilant, and principled, unafraid of any consequences, for there is nothing greater in the existence under the grace of God than to be upright. فَأَقِمْ وَجْهَكَ لِلدِّينِ حَنِيفًا فِطْرَةَ اللَّهِ الَّتِي فَطَرَ النَّاسَ عَلَيْهَا لَا تَبْدِيلَ لِخَلْقِ اللَّهِ Keep your faces upright, for that is the mission of life. Everything we acquire materially, our children, our wealth, 
They are all the beauty of this world. But principle of truthfulness and maintaining harmony to bring peace for humanity and not to be subjected under anyone's tyrannical rule and not to be a slave of anyone. For every human being is born free and we must die free. When Allah says, وَإِذْ قَالَ رَبُّكَ لِلْمَلَائِكَةِ إِنِّي جَاعِلٌ فِي الْأَرْضِ خَلِيفَةً Allah decreed the Khulafa on this earth. Why? So that there is harmony, there is leadership, there is progress. But these leaders defy the common leader. For the common leader gets into power, they only want positive things for themselves. Otherwise, they abandon their leadership. They abscond their positions, as one would say in English. But you find the leaders of God, whether they are receiving grace like Suleiman, who becomes a king with such wealth that no human being has ever possessed that kind of wealth ever before nor ever after. Or Ayyub, who Allah takes everything away from him, yet he doesn't change his tempo with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And of course, the greatest message that we can all put together Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam salawat ala Muhammad wa al Muhammad. Who is the axis of deen? An Nabiyu awla bil mu'minina min anfusihim. The Prophet has greater right over you than you have over yourselves. So that's how central he is to the deen. He is the axis of the religion of God. All Prophets recognized him from Adam. All the way to all the Ulul Azam prophets recognize Rasulullah as the axis of prophets who will come and complete the religion of God as a favor to mankind. And the reflection of the prophet, as the prophet said, My Ahlul Bayt, after me there will be 12 over me. Awaluna wa awsatuna wa akhiruna wa kulluna Muhammad. They're all me. The first, the middle, the end, they're all me. What is their function? To protect this message. How does it start? The Prophet says, Ana Madinatul Ilm, wa aliyun babuha, wa man arad al Madina, fal yatiha min babiha. Tonight's commemoration is in recognition of the divine leadership. For when you remove such divine leadership, and give leadership to illegitimacy, it leads to chaos and destruction in the world as is prevalent today. For the Kaaba and the house of the Prophet in the Medina, the city, as we say, Madinatul Munawwara, is under the control of tyrants and thieves, criminals who indiscriminately kill because they want power the way shaitan likes it. And they claim to be agents of God, Khadimul Haramain, when they are the furthest from the truth. They walk around pontificating the way the Umayyads and the Abbasids did. And they are evil and wretched. And they continue to foment and destroy the harmony on earth in cahoots with the superpowers of the world, using the most sophisticated weapons on the most innocent people, such as in Yemen. That can only happen when leadership is corrupt. Tonight's commemoration is recognition of true leadership. When we shed tears tonight, we recognize where true leadership lies. And among us, we all have a small component of that leadership. You and I need to be leaders in the Ummah. You and I need to be witnesses for mankind. For Rasulullah and the Ahlul Bayt are witnesses over us. When we cry for Zainab alayhi salam, when we cry for Ruqayya, when we, fr when we cry for Rabab, and all the women who are present in Karbala, we should cry to say, we will take this banner. For you've given enough. You are our witnesses. Now we are going to be witnesses upon mankind, which means you and I must practice the Islam and not give lip service and recognize leadership and recognize the command of God and submit to it. Otherwise, we are the promoters of evil. In our ignorance we could be or in our outright desire to reject Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
For there is no excuse under the sky for you and I to say that life was difficult when our blessed Imam has established the finest example that look under such difficulty I have given my family and did you see me complain but other than say ridham bi qada wa tasliman li amri we submit to your decree ya allah and we submit by your authority for that is true leadership that when the prophet said ana madinatul ilm you find these ahl al bayt who are they they are reflectors of rasulullah illegitimate leaders are deflectors of rasulullah there's a big difference agents of god chosen by allah and his prophet reflect rasulullah agents who claim to take authority when it's not theirs will do nothing but deflect they are called taghut in the quran and allah says faman yakfur bit taghut wa yu'min billah faqad istamsaka bil urwati al wathqa imam hussein alayhi salam did not complain and you and i many of us God forbid have given up praying belief in God fasting charity kindness to each other because we've lost hope complaining to God that why is my life so difficult why isn't it so pleasant as those others around me what excuse do you and I have for tonight when we reiterate the tragedy of Karbala and we can never exhaust this event if we had lectures every night on ashura 365 days a year i promise you we will not feel and understand the full depth of this great sacrifice you will find many a sacrifices have taken place even hamza ibn abdul muttalib the is sayyid ash-shuhada but no one carries the banner of the highest position as we say the apex of shuhada as imam hussein alayhi salam and his companions in karbala you know there are soldiers in america who have died and their parents decided to walk across the united states from the west coast to the east and when asked why are you doing this they said we don't want our children's name to fade away so natural phenomenon we all want to keep alive those who die in the cause of god but tell me which death on earth can equal the death of those in karbala in principle in the highest positions of haq against batil the highest position of justice and truth against injustice and falsehood we cannot find any example on earth i challenge it go out and find it never in the annals of history will you and i find anything superior when it comes to the essence of haq as in karbala and when the prophet say they are my protectors they are my gate and whoever wants to enter the city the prophet says i am the city of knowledge and ali is the gate whoever has a desire to enter this city must enter through that gate woman arad al madina fal yatiha min babiha enter from that gate why because they are the guardians the protectors the khulafa who will keep the deen of allah pure who will guide mankind till judgment day and will not allow shaitan to come in and split the deen of allah and leave us a carcass shell to follow the deen is in is intact when allah says to the holy prophet ya ayyuhar rasul ballagh ma unzila ilayka min rabbik wa in lam taf'al fama ballaghta risalatak wallahu ya'simuka min an-nas o messenger deliver that which has been promised has been commanded of you to deliver and if you don't deliver then you have not delivered the message we establish this historical component of this verse having been revealed upon the holy prophet in the last days of his life prayer was established fasting was established the quran was established was completed the rules and laws that god has given to adam have been perfected and completed the religion is intact 
the Kaaba has been purified. It has been repositioned as the center of worship. So then why is Allah says, if you don't do this, then you have not delivered. Why? You know, in Karbala, they were Sahaba of Rasulullah on Yazid's army. They were companions of the Prophet on Yazid's army. They were Huffad of Quran in Yazid's army. You know that? Some knew the Quran by heart and they still pulled the arrow on the very heart of the Quran. Amazing how ignorant mankind is that they utter, as Allah says, Hushubun Musannada. They are like pieces of wood embellished, for they haven't understood it. And Allah says, Wala in sa'altahum, man khalaqa samawati wal ard, la yaqulun Allah. Allah says, Qul alhamdulillah, bal akhtarhum la ya'lamun. When they're asked who created the earth and sky, those disbelievers who kill will tell you God. Allah says, you haven't understood God. For don't say that. Say glory be to God. There's a big difference when you say God means you're disconnected. You're deistic. You're contentious. You are arguing against God. But when you say, Qul alhamdulillah, I submit and I praise him and I recognize his mercy and I follow him and I obey him. Allah says, few of you know this. Qul alhamdulillah, bal akhtarum la ya'lamun. Most of you don't understand. We think that because I know Quran, because I pray that I'm a pure, pious Muslim. If it doesn't absorb into the heart, if the Quran doesn't get absorbed, if there's no tafakkur and tadabbur and tadhakkur in the Quran, then God forbid when Imam Sahib al-Zaman reappears, God forbid maybe we're on the opposite sides waiting to kill him. But leadership, comes with that strength of understanding, reflection. That's why I keep saying, brothers and sisters, we are the lovers of Ahl al-Bayt. We honor them. We ensure that on these important nights, we leave all our works and come and recognize Imam Hussein. We come and give ourselves to this night. But I advise us all sincerely, let's practice it. Let's bury the hatchets. Let's bury the animosity. Let's kill the mischief. Let's stop the fault finding. Let's encourage prayer. Let's encourage God consciousness. Let's recognize that our leaders are the finest. And let's teach ourselves and our children to follow within their footsteps perfectly so that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bless us. لا يلتكم من أعمالكم شيئا قل إن كنتم تحبون الله فاتبعوني يحببكم الله ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم Allah says say to them they claim to love God إن كنتم تحبون الله فاتبعوني then obey me then God will love you and forgive you and protect you ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم otherwise it doesn't work lip service means nothing to Allah and I wonder, how could anybody be on Yazid's side on that day, on that fateful day? How did they have the audacity to strike the very heart of the walking, talking Quran when they were companions? Hmm? We have it in us. Tonight is a night of reflection, my brothers and sisters. Tonight, after these lectures, go home, gather, do dhikr, do a'mal, pray to God, ask for forgiveness that Ya Allah, on this very momentous night, many events took place in history. Even the Bible mentions this great night that will happen at the banks of the Euphrates. Biblically, many, many events will take place at the banks of Euphrates. Particularly this, that even when Ibrahim alayhi salam, Command follows the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he thinks he is slaughtering his child by the command of God. Allah is merciful. He will not let a prophet slaughter his child. But Allah tests you. He says, 
Do you love me? How much do you love me? Will your children and your wealth come in your way? Will it come in your way? Hmm? The love of this world distracts you. So Allah tests Ibrahim. We tested him with a very difficult test. And that test was enormous. That Ibrahim salam goes and he asks his son, I have seen this in this in my dream. Inni arafil manam. That I must sacrifice you. The religion of God is for mercy. But if we don't sacrifice, if we're not willing to give up our distractions, then our obedience to God is questionable. This is why Imam Hussein is so great. That he gladly gave his children, his sons, his nephews, 17 members of Banu Hashim were martyred in Karbala. 17 of them out of 72. A large portion was from the children of Muslim ibn Aqil, the cousin of, the prof, of Imam, the one who became Shaheed in Kufa. Did they question? Did they doubt? We honor them. We name our children after them. We love them. But Allah will question us on judgment day. You name them. How much effort did you make to follow their footsteps? How much did you teach your children to be like them? Did you try? And Allah says, if you get into petty fights and fault finding and gossiping and lack of faith, then we've lost it. We need to struggle every single day. Allah says, Fadkuruni adkurkum. Remember me. I will remember you. Washkuruni wala takfurun. And be grateful to me and don't do kufr. These representatives in Karbala were obedient servants. You and I, brothers and sisters, I will say sincerely on this important night, may Allah bless every one of us here <coughs> present. As we say, Adam Allah ujurana wa ujurakum. May God reward us for this grief, for the tragedy of Imam Hussein. And his message is going to continue to grow, I promise. There is no greater media on earth than the media of Hussein ibn Ali alayhi salam. No media better than this. It's growing every day. The CIA, the KGB, the Mossad is studying us very carefully. For the tyrants of the world know that if there is going to be a force that is going to bring down Goliaths on this earth, it is Hussein ibn Ali's spirit. We see it already. It's no secret. We see the resistance taking place. The formulations for what? To conquer the world so we can rule the world? No. We have no interest in that. Our interest is to bring peace for all of mankind. Christians, Jews, atheists, Buddhists, Hindus, Muslims. Everybody needs to live in peace and harmony. And everybody must be allowed to practice the religion. Because Allah says, لا إكراه في الدين. There is no compulsion in religion. قد تبين الرشد من الغي. Truth is clear from error. We are the proponents of truth. We do not subject anyone to tyranny. We do not subject anyone to forceful Submission to religion. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't even allow Musa to do that to Fir'aun. Allah said, وَقُولَ لَوْ قَوْلًا لَيِّنًا When you speak to him, speak to Fir'aun with a soft tongue. For maybe you will incite his heart to come towards me. This is the religion we are fighting for. This is why we are shedding tears. This is why we are in grief. This is why we wear black, not the ISIS black. The one that goes and indiscriminately kills. No, we cry because injustice took place. The kind of injustice that's the highest form. And if people ask us, why do you cry? Tell them, which example can you give me better than such violation of good? You and I can go watch a Hollywood movie, totally fiction. And there is an orphan being abused or orphans being abused. And in the movie, if you and I do not shed tears, then maybe our hearts are too hard. Though it's fiction. But it's not about fiction. It's about principles that makes us cry. It's about the essence that makes us cry. That even if animals are being, if there's a 
Disney movie about an animal being punished, you and I should cry because it's not the object, it's the principle behind the object. And Imam Ali alayhi salam says, مَا جَفَّتِ الدَّمُوا إِلَّا لِقَسْوَةِ الْقُلُوبِ وَمَا قَسَّتِ الْقُلُوبِ إِلَّا لِكَثْرَةِ الدُّنُوبِ Tears don't come out when hearts are hard. And hearts don't get hard until they are filled with sin. So let's get rid of sin. Let's make our hearts pliant. Let's make it soft. That the minute we see any kind of injustice, an animal, a dog being dragged, an insect being mutilated, your heart should say, stop. I don't like that. I'm against that. Why? Because I follow the footpath and the footsteps of God and his prophets. For my religion tells me to be eco-sensitive and to be conscious of the human race and to be conscious of every living thing out there. Even inanimate, non-living things should not be emaciated or obliterated or damaged. That's the deen of Allah. But Imam Hussain says, how do you reach that stage? Be conscious. Be principled. Keep away from evil. Maintain good. And when you are cornered, remember God. The way Yunus remembered Allah. Yunus alayhi salam says, Fanada fi dhulumat an la ilaha illa anta subhanaka inni kuntu min al dhalimeen. He called out from the darkness of the whale. He said, There is no God but you. And I am in darkness. Allah says, Fastajabna lahu wa najjaynahu min al gham. We replied him and we took him out of his misery. And Allah says, were he not to call on me, he would have remained in it till the day of judgment. For he would have perished. For there is no better living than turning to Allah. I mentioned the other day, rich people when they are in their hospital beds, they are worth a billion dollars. Not one extra dime will help them <clears throat> be cured. What's left? Tell me what's left. Prayer. Salah. You say to a person who's sick, I pray for you. Subhanallah, priceless. Priceless. Do you say, well, I'll give you extra money. I'll bring you new clothes. I'll buy you a nice house to, to make you feel good. The sick person looks at you and says, what's wrong with you? I am ill. There is nothing that helps us more than salah. Prayer, prayer, research shows. Harvard did studies, other universities did studies. Amazing that people who pray were cured faster than people who didn't pray. Because when you pray, there is hope. You become the placebo effect. You believe that you're going to get cured because Allah says, لا تقنط من رحمة الله What I put in you is a universe. Use it. And pray to me. Get the strength. Don't leave it. It's the only thing that's left. When the plane is crashing, I remember when my uncle was on a plane filled with Chinese who were mostly atheists. And the pilot said, we're going to do a land, landing that's going to be on the belly and we will crash. All of them started murmuring, holding on. Because your life is now in front of you. All in a split second. All your plans are ready to be wiped out. Experts in near-death experience say that when persons fall from high places about to die, the most incredible experience takes place to them. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross is a famous expert on death and dying. She said people clearly see their entire life from the day they were born to that moment in three-dimensional expressions it's all in one second and they will tell you with detail every event in that vision while they're falling Allah says I record everything everything is recorded you have it and I will bring it out but why is it when a person is falling Allah is letting them know okay you were thinking it's a foolish thing well here it is and it's a stunning reality that if they survive, they tell them that I saw my whole life in front of me in a split second.
split. But you will notice that when that plane was crashing, they were murmuring. Alhamdulillah, the plane landed safely. The gears opened up. True story. My uncle asked them, do you believe in God? They said, no. Then what were you murmuring? He says, to God. Then we believe. We didn't believe before. But right before the crash, we believed. And Quran says that. وَإِذَا غَشَّهُ مَوْجٌ كَالْضُلَلِي دَعْوُ اللَّهَ مُخْلِسِينَ لَهُ الدِّينَ فَلَمَّا نَجَّاهُمْ إِلَى الْبَرِّ فَمِنْهُمْ مُقْتَصِدْ وَمَا يَجْهَدُ بِآيَاتِنَا إِلَّا كُلَّ خَتَّارٍ كَفُورٍ كُلُّ خَتَّارٍ كَفُورٍ Who is that person? The one who, Allah says, when the wave is covering them, they turn to God. Oh God, please save me. What comes to mind? Dua. Salah, prayer, we belittle it. I've got no time for this. Ah, prayer is not important. Right now, I've got a business meeting. I've got this phone call to take. It's very important for me. We are all, most of us, many of us, are guilty of that. But we don't realize that the real essence of life, the true meaning, is when push comes to shove, nothing saves us more. So the security that you and I have is dua and salah. And the best security is when you do it when you are comfortable. For when you are in grief and you go, one could say, well, you are pulled in that direction. And alhamdulillah, it's good we do it. For there's nothing better than to pray to God when in grief. But I advise us all, regardless of grief or no grief, constantly remember Allah because there's nothing more powerful in life than that because research shows people who pray are happier, healthier, and they don't get sick as often. But I'm not talking about the prayer of show off. The one Allah said, فَوَيْلٌ لِلْمُصَلِّينَ الَّذِينَ مَنْ صَلَاتِهِمْ سَعُونَ Not the one who does it to show off. The one who does prayer in secret. إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يَخْشَوْنَ رَبَّهُمْ بِالْغَيْبِ لَهُمْ مَغْفِرَةٌ وَأَجْرٌ كَبِيرٌ وَأَسِرُّ قَوْلَكُمْ أَوِذْهَرُ إِنَّهُ عَلِيمٌ بِذَاتِ السُّدُورِ Prayer, when you pray and remember God in secret, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يَخْشَوْنَ رَبَّهُمْ بِالْغَيْبِ That one gets the most reward. And whether you make it public or hidden, God says, I know what lies in you. Power of prayer. Now you might be thinking, but that's a person praying. Hmm. But research shows the most amazing reality. That even people who don't pray, who don't even know you or me, and if we pray for them, research shows that they get cured better than others. Subhanallah. So let's say you're passing by the hospital and you're going through the ward and you're seeing people on their deathbeds or sick. And you look at them, they don't know you, you don't know them. But you pray for them, Ya Allah, please, I beg you, my Lord. Amma yujibul muttarra idha da'aw. Ya Allah, bring this person to health. Research shows that even the one who's sick doesn't know that they're being prayed for, they get cured faster than the ones who are not prayed for. What does that say about the divine mercy of God? When we talk about this pure, high, positive spirit of karma, as we call it, which is what the rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that when we pray in positive ways, even if we don't know we're being prayed for, we are the beneficiaries of benefits. From that point of view, what is the best thing to do other than to pray? Tell me, sisters and brothers. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. We don't need researchers to tell us. Scientists have studied that simply rolling up your sleeves and rinsing your arm. If you heard a lie or you heard something negative, negative energy, by rinsing your arms, you forget it. Research shows. It's amazing research. Even the nature of positive thinking brings positive results. Just have positive thinking. Somebody says something negative to you, 
Say, oh, thank you. That was very nice. I need to learn more. Alhamdulillah. Thank you for exposing my wrong. You know, think, just be positive. You lose something? So Alhamdulillah, I'm so glad I lost that. Maybe it's not good for me. Positive. Constant positivity. Karbala was entirely positive on Imam Hussain's side. This is the most amazing reality of Karbala. That while he is cornered, his family is being taunted, he is being taunted, but he, sees, he says nothing but positive things about Allah, positive things about humanity, and never ever turns any negative into negative. This, I think, is the most powerful thing. Today we have kids who are talking about suicide. Suicide has increased by 30%. Since 2012, more people are killing themselves than being killed. Depression is on the rise. These suicide, by the way, is forbidden in Islam. Haram. Don't ever say, I've had it enough, I'm just going to kill myself. Don't ever say that, ever. For if you do that, shaitan's got you. For Allah says, my mercy, under no circumstance should you take it away until it's your time for me to take it. You have no right to kill yourself. You can never say enough is enough. No, have faith in Allah. There is nothing stronger than belief and faith in Allah. Even if you are put in solitary confinement, nothing is more powerful than faith in Allah. Imam Musa ibn Jafar al kadhim alayhi salatu wasalam, our seventh Imam, was put in solitary confinement for decades. Yet he was constantly in ibadah. The caliph of the time would send people to disturb him, but he would not be disturbed. In fact, he would make them believers. Even women of bad character would be sent to distract him, and he would bring them to Islam. And when they would enter, they would come back and say, he's not there. They said, no, he's under the Aba. Look at him. He's doing sujood and ruku. Rukka'an sujjadan yabtaguna fadla min Allah wa ridwan. Seemahum fi wujuhihim min atharis sujood. You will see them praying. Not in extreme ways, ISIS-like. No. Full of reason. Full of wisdom. Full of kindness. Full of love. That if a man came to Imam and says, I don't like what, you know, starts complaining about the Imam. Imam says, if what you say is true, then I seek forgiveness. And if what you say is not true, then I forgive you. That's positive thinking. A man comes to Imam Hussain alayhi salam and prevents the Imam from moving his horse and starts to throw really negative statements against the Imam. Imam Hussain alayhi salam gently looks at him, gets off his horse, comes towards the man. Now typically what would you and I do? Hmm? Look at our communities, filled with rage. We cut each other, we demand seats, we demand parking, we want it, we want it, we want it. It's got to be mine. And if you take it from me, it's my right. What if somebody says a negative thing to us? Hmm? That you are like this, and I don't like you. you we, would, we would be enraged. The Imam looks at the man and says, you look tired. You must have had a long journey. How about you come home? We eat lunch together. Rest. And we can continue this dialogue. The man begins to cry because he says, God knows where to put his leaders. For I cannot seem to ignite you negatively. They always maintain their anger and they're always forgiving mankind. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Imam Ali alayhi salam was like that. Even when he cut the legs of Amr bin Abdul you know, Amr struck Imam Ali from above. Imam was shorter than him. He was taller. He had the advantage over him. Historians say that when Imam Ali Islam comes out of the tent to go fight Amr bin Abdul, who was the arch enemy of God, a kafir of the highest kind, representing the Meccan army in the early days, when he fought in the battle of Khandaq, the battle of the ditch, the Prophet asked his companions, who will go fight the arch enemy of God? Everybody was trembling. Amar used to wear jewels. You know, his armor had jewels on it. 
You don't wear jewels when you go fight. But he's taunting the enemy that you can't kill me. Look, I have my jewels and I'm going to defeat you anyway. Imam Ali alayhi salam was fully clad. He comes and gives him three options. Leave me, become believer, or I kill you. Amr starts to laugh. He says, you are giving me conditions? Imam repeats it. Look at the shujaat, rijalun, la tulhihim tijaratun, wa la bay'un an dhikrillah. Imam Ali alayhi salam on the battlefield was a lion. Nobody could touch him. Khaybar, when Allah says, you know, dabhan. You know, when the horse hits rocks, it was giving sparks. Imam Ali alayhi salam gets on the horse and goes to defeat Khaybar. Marhab was the chief of their fighters. Nobody could penetrate that fortress. The Prophet said to his companions, watch. My brother will go and put the flag up. You watch. Watch him. And when he rode the horse, and as the horse was striking the rocks, the sparks were coming out. Allah says, by the strike of the hoofs of the horse. Allah talks about him. Hmm? Nabil Adim has many meanings. One is the day of judgment. But Imam Ali salam says to Muawiyah on the day of Safin, he says, Ana an-Nabil Adim, alladihum fi mukhtalifun. You have a dispute. It's me. I am that dispute because I am the gate to the city of knowledge. And you all want to replace the gate with your own kinds because you want to tear the city of knowledge apart. But we will not allow it. Imam Ali was so swift that when Amr strikes him, after the Imam gives him the condition, Imam blocks it with his shield. They say the strike was so hard that it cut through his helmet and it actually touched his skull. But he blocked it. And all we heard was Allahu Akbar. Because while Amr's hand was up here, Imam's hand was down there. And he cut his legs off. He was so swift, cut his legs off and Amr falls. Now Imam is looking at him. The giant of giants fallen. People are stunned. The Meccans are stunned. Who is this man who brought our giant down? He sits in front on top of him. He's ready to send him to where he belongs. He spits on him. Imam walks away, comes back and sends him where he belongs. People ask, why did you walk away? He says, I was not angry. The Imam was not angry. But he doesn't want any of us to ever think that he killed for Allah in anger. Well, kadhimin al ghayr To that accuracy that the Imam walks away, comes back, and then kills him. Showing that don't you ever accuse me that when we fight for Allah, it is only for Allah. For they say when Imam Ali salam was breaking bread among the people, he was having a hard time breaking it. And they said, Amir al-Mu'mineen, you are Asadullah Ghalib. You are the lion of God. You bring giants down. You cannot break bread. He said, bread is for me. I am da'if. I am weak. He says, Anta al-Maliku wa anna al-Mamluk. Fahal yarhamu al-Mamluk illa al-Malik. Imam Ali was so humble that when he walked the streets, people thought he was one of the beggars. There was a beggar who was in the house of Imam Ali. Imam Hassan and Imam Hussein are feeding him and he's taking food and putting it in his pocket. Imam Hussein salam notices that and says to him, if you need food, we will give you. You don't have to put it in your pocket. He says, no, it's not for me. It's for a person out there who's very poor, more poor than me. Imam Hussain says, describe him to me. He says, his shoes are so strewn that there is no more room to mend. His dress is so simple that he is most abject in the way he dresses. Imam tells him, it's okay, don't worry. That's the owner of this house. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. That humbleness, it is wisdom. People came and asked him, what's the distance between the earth and the sun? 
he gave it in a horse trot. Then some of the companions says, Ali, you're so quick. This is a very complicated mathematical question. How did you come up with the answer so quickly? Should you not take time? The Imam looks at the companion and says, how many fingers? He said, two. The Imam says, you're so quick. And the man looks, he says, that's what I see. My wisdom, what Allah has given me to guide you as the Khalifatullah, don't underestimate it. I read hearts, I read minds. For my justice, he says, if you open up the seat of justice for me, I will not deny an insect that grain of rice that it deserves. That level of justice doesn't exist in this world today. It doesn't exist among ourselves and our people. But those are the kind of leaders we have. In history, there is nobody like them. That's why the Prophet said, Lahmuhum lahmi wa damuhum dami. Allahumma wali man wala wa adi man ada. Wan sur man nasara wa khdul man khadala. I make peace with those who make peace with them. And whoever considers me their master, they are your masters. Obey them. And if you don't, you will go astray. Look at the world today. It is so ridden with carnage. People claiming to be caliphs and taking armies and taking money from enemies of Allah. Big difference between that and this. But you find our imams gentle, full of wisdom. They hold back anger. They are firm. They don't allow anything to come in between. Even a man came to Imam Jafar Sadiq and starts cursing the Imam. I tell you, these stories are important to know because we wouldn't understand it. You find that the companions see the Imam is gentle, smiling, no problem. Imam says, come with me, you companions. I will show you the solution to this man's problems. You and I don't have that hikmah generally. So we react falsely. Imam takes money and he approaches the man's farm. And as he's approaching, the man is standing by the door and he sees the Imam approaching slowly. The man comes to the Imam thinking that now maybe he has a rebuttal. Maybe he wants to make a, you know, a counter statement since you said something bad. Now I need to do justice and I need to give you back. Imam says, I have come to ask what the price of your land is. So the man says, why? He says, I would like to buy it. Simple, but incredibly powerful. Solution, solution. The man gives him a number. Imam alayhi salam doubles it. He says, I'll give you double. You can't refuse that offer, can you? He said, no. He said, here's the money. I bought the land. The man looks up the sky, he said, Ya Allah, you know where to put your imams. You know where to put your leaders. Imam looks at the companions. He says, you know why he was angry with me? Because he knows I'm the agent of God and his land was not producing fruits. So he was angry with God. His anger came towards me. So I solved it for him by pacifying it and giving him what he wants so that he stops having this negative thinking. Can you imagine such leadership in the world today? Look around. You'll hardly see it. Karbala, when Allah says, Wasta'inu bis sabri was salah, maintain prayer, maintain patience and prayer. Patience, prayer. Luqman says to his son, My son, be patient. It is a very difficult thing to do. Wasbir ala ma asabak, in the min azmil umur. Patience, patience is impossible if there's no long term vision. I advise us all, how do we solve the problem? Start thinking about the Day of Judgment. Start asking ourselves, what am I going to answer Allah for all that I've done? The Prophet said, Hasibu qabla an tuhasabu. Do your hisab before Allah does your hisab. Zinu qabla an tuzanu. Weigh it before God weighs it. This thinking calms us down, makes us honest, trustworthy, long term vision. Which means patience is the most difficult act to practice. And here Allah says, Ya yuladina amanu sta'inu bis sabri was salat, inna Allah ma'as sabirin. I want you to pay attention to what God is saying. 
all mankind. Seek help through patience and prayer. Prayer. Imam Hussain alayhi salam asked to pray on the night of Ashura. Prayer. They prayed on the day of Ashura. And as his beings killed and beheaded, he's in the state of prayer. And they say every prophet, before they died, they said, as salah as salah For without prayer, what is the value of the morals of this world? It's not an exercise in futility. It's deep. But the Allah in the Quran says something most amazing. He says, Inna Allah sabirin Indeed, Allah is with the patient ones. There's one thing to say that the patient ones are with Allah. But when Allah says, I am with the patient ones, that's a whole different conversation. Inna Allah sabirin وَلَا تَقُولُ لِمَنْ يُقْتَلُ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ أَمْوَاتُ بَلَحْيَا Don't say those who die in the name of God are dead. Nay, they are alive. They are alive. بَلَحْيَا وَلَكِنْ لَا تَشْعُرُونَ But you cannot see them. And we will test you with a thorough test. وَلَنَبْلُوَنَّكُمْ بِشَيْءٍ مِنَ الْخَوْفِ With fear, loss of life. How? Through enemies. Allah doesn't send the enemy to punish me. No. Allah says, I gave you limited free will. There will be foolish individuals who will let go of their obligations and they will follow shaitan. They will have satanic inclinations and they will cause harm and damage for the rest of humanity like MBS today in the occupied territories of Jazirat al-Arab. They buy $500 million yachts in a heartbeat. People's money. They buy yachts. They throw money. They come to America and buy the most sophisticated weaponries. Like prostitutes. For what? To kill. Not that group. Allah says, me, the one who gets tested. How? By those tyrants, the Yazids of today. And they will come and harm you. And when you speak, they will silence you. They will send spies to threaten you. But don't be afraid of them. Allah says, don't be afraid. Give good news to those who are patient. When they are in this difficult trial, they get down to the core. Inna lillah. They say, Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi rajiun. We are from Allah and our return is to Allah. Allah says, Ulaika alayhim salawatu min rabbim wa rahmah. Those are the ones who I send blessings and mercy. Wa ulaika humul muhtadun. And these are the ones who will be successful on Judgment Day. These are the ones who are successful and guided. Imam Hussain alayhi salam to the T with his companions and his family in Karbala to the T fulfills this verse. To the T fulfills Rijalun la tulhihim tijaratun wa la bayyun an dhikrillah. Inna Allah shtara. Allah purchases from the believers their selves and their wealth to the T or Ahlul Bayt. To the T is the event of Karbala. Now, I can speak like this and we can nod, but I'm just saying to us in the spirit of tonight, in the dua of tonight, let us make a resolution to not give up salah. Let us make a resolution to remember Allah all the time. When they ask you about me, indeed I am near. But Allah says, I reply them when they ask me. Allah 100% replies even animals. But Allah has a condition. This condition must not be forgotten. Allah says, فَلْيَسْتَجِيبُ then answer my call. Well, you minu be and believe in me. So that you are rightly guided. Meaning you and I should not sit around and do nothing. You and I should do positive things. Yesterday a brother came to me and says, Brother, you're right. I should not ask what's next. What can I do next? I said, bravo, now go and do something good. Go take an orphan and feed them. Go take care of a child who needs education. Go clothe the family. Go feed the hungry. Do something because time is ticking away. If you and I don't do good, we will lose the great potential of being in the highest stations of 
the next world. Please, brothers and sisters, don't be caught with negatives. Take every negative and use it positive. Somebody is saying bad things to you. If your parents are not loving you, then give them an excuse that maybe they are too occupied. But know that they are sacrificing. When people say bad things to us, say, Alhamdulillah, maybe they're exposing my real weakness. Hmm? Alhamdulillah, they're taking my sins. When someone backbites, they take the sins. When people try to stop us, Alhamdulillah, resistance is good. You go to the gym and you've got big biceps, you don't pick two pounders, you don't pick five pounders, it's embarrassing unless you're trying to build muscles in your fingers. You take the heaviest. Which one? The one that gives you the most resistance. For you know without pain there is no gain. How is it that in the world when we have all these trials and tribulations and all kinds of systems out there to stop us from progressing, should you and I not think the same in calisthenics that that resistance makes us strong? How about we think positive that way and say it's okay. I'm being challenged. I'm being threatened. It's okay. Allah says, use it positively. The way my agents in Karbala used to look at each other and they were waiting to enter paradise. They were using shahada as a means to reach high stages. That when Muslim Ibn Awsaja is breathing his last, Habib Ibn Madair says, Oh Muslim, how lucky you are to see the Prophet by the pool of Kawthar before me. How lucky you are, oh Muslim Ibn Awsaja. Can you imagine having such a conversation in a massacre? That's how the Imams were. That's how the companions were. You and I on this night should leave this place and say everything negative. I'm going to make it positive for it will bury the hatchet. It will take my anger away. It will make me wiser. It will make me more patient. It will make me more long-term thinker. And inshallah I will succeed. Tonight we conclude. As you know I will be giving one more lecture tomorrow night. It is important to talk after Karbala's event because the real essence of Karbala's tragedy starts after the Shahada. What happened after Imam Hussain and his companions were killed? What happened is where the real essence of the message of Imam Hussain really comes to fruition. When Zainab salam is challenging the Caliph, when she's challenging Ibn Ziyad, when Imam Zainul Abidin climbs up the pulpit and challenges Yazid point blank and tells him who he is, the revolution of Imam Hussein went into the belly of the beast. And the sacrifices, the way the women struggled, they were chained and dragged city to city. Imam Zain al Abidin was not allowed even to ride a camel. He walked, he was dragged on the hot sands. He was thirsty, they used to pour water in front of him to taunt him. But he would look up and say, Ridham bi qada wa taslim al Imam Hussain alayhi salam knew this. He knew this. And tonight, although this happened on the daytime, it happened during the day of Ashura. Because tomorrow morning in the afternoon, I advise us all to go to all these other Islamic centers that are in our neighborhood. Go and do a'mal. Remember this momentous event. Make Ashura the center of our lives. Never give it up. Use it as the spirit. This and Ramadan. Fly with it. And in between, the events of prophets and imams. Use it as a security measure to keep our heads upright. So the story of Karbala. Imam is taken there unwillingly. He negotiates with Ibn Sa'd and says to Umar, let me go to India. Me and my family, we will leave you, but don't ask us for this bayah. Do not ask us to give allegiance to Yazid. We will not do that. It is not our way ever, under no circumstance, now why was Yazid asking for Imam Hussein's bay'ah? Because Yazid knew the Imam is the Imam of the time. He wanted to validate. If you go back in history, you will see Napoleon Bonaparte was a general of the French army. When he took control and declared himself an emperor, he had no legitimacy. He had to ask the Pope to come from the Vatican to validate his emperorship. 
a general who went all the way to Egypt to fight. Powerful man has no validity until the man of God in his faith comes and validates him and gives him authority. Yazid had nothing. He needed Imam Hussein's seal of approval. And Yazid was paying money, offering money for any kind to legitimize himself. Imam says, I will never do it, ever, ever. In fact, when he arrives in Karbala on the 3rd of Muharram, he talks to the enemies. Every time he got an opportunity, he would get on his horse, he would take Abbas alayhi salam, he'd take Ali Akbar, he'd take his companions, and they would come in front of the army and he would talk to them. Oh, you people, listen to me. Didn't you send me this letter? Hmm? Didn't you send me this letter? Shabit ibn Ra Ra Rabi, did you not write me a letter? You, they acted like they had amnesia. We don't remember. They even lied publicly in front of the Imam. Imam said, Allah will reckon what you have said. For you have written and you have backed out. Rabi ibn, this person, Shabit ibn Rabi, was a mole. You know what a mole is? A Trojan horse like Samiri who joined Musa to create fitna. He was like that for 20 years. He created fitna in everything. He would enter, pretend to be Shia of Ali. He would create fitna, then he would leave. Then he'd come back and create fitna and he would leave. These were the kind of enemies on Yazid's side. But Imam used to use the basic argument. You claim to be Muslims. You do shahadatain. Imam Zainal Abideen eloquently exposes that in the palace of Yazid. When Adhan is being called, it was not prayer time, but because Imam Zainal Abideen was talking, and Yazid looks around and he sees his Syrians are all crying, because Imam Zainal Abideen now is for the first time telling them what the truth is, because these people never heard of the truth. Because remember, his father and his uncle were the commanders of Syria. So they lied, 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 lied. First time Imam Zainal Abideen is sitting and he calls this, this pieces of wood and he's telling the people, and Yazid doesn't like it. He says to the Muadhan, do Adhan, do Adhan. It's not prayer time. Just to silence the Imam. So when he says, Allahu Akbar, Imam silences, he says, Jalla Jalla Allah Rabbi. Then the man says, Ashhadu Anna Muhammad Rasul. He says, Askut, be quiet, you Muadhan, be quiet. And the Muadhan is quiet. He looks at Yazid and the people. He said, who is this Muhammad? Your grandfather or my grandfather? Who is he? That Allah has commanded you to honor us in the Quran. You killed us, you beheaded us, and you have taken us as prisoners. What kind of Muslims are you? It was so simple. Today we have many schools of thought. People are confused which school of thought is right. This one nails it. If you have any doubt, look here, and the Imam is saying, where do you lie? Hmm? Where does this truth lie? Tell me, for we are the skyons, the center. We are the gate to the city of knowledge. Imam Hussain comes to the enemy and says, who am I? My grandfather, my uncle, hmm? Hamza. Don't you know my father? He says, don't you know our generation? We are the flag bearers. We are the ones who purified the Kaaba. Now you've cornered me? And the people turn a deaf ear. They are deaf. They act like they haven't heard you. Imam says, it's okay. I've done my hujjah. On the night of Ashur, on the day actually, the ninth day, the enemy starts to attack because Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad sends a letter to Umar ibn Sa'ad. Do not wait, get the bay'ah of Hussein. So Umar ibn Sa'ad starts to attack Imam Hussein. Abbas is on the front lines and he blocks them. And Imam calls Ibn Sa'ad. He said, okay, what's this? What's this commotion? Why are you attacking us now? He says, well, I've been commanded to take your bay'ah or kill you. He said, okay, if you cannot negotiate with me to leave, then give me one night. This is the night. Give me one night, O oh, Ibn Sa'ad. Let us pray, for we love to pray. Historians say that the ashab of Imam Hussain in Karbala were all murmuring zikr of Allah in sujood, in ruku, talking to each other about how tomorrow they're going to see the Prophet. That vision is the spirit of life. That's what really counts. Our homes, our money. It's all a distraction. 
This is what counts. But many of us don't understand. We look at it like, okay. But I ask us all, including myself, that please, Ya Allah, give me that spirit. Where Qasim ibn al-Hassan, the son of Imam Hassan alayhi salam, goes to Imam Hussain. He says, Ammu, my grand, my uncle, death is sweeter to me than honey. A 13-year-old telling his uncle, death is sweeter to me than honey. What 13-year-old would say that? Because they knew the meaning. He stood there firm, not afraid. I think you and I do it to reflect, Ya Allah, how can I get that stability? Where I see Day of Judgment so clearly that all my transactions are built on halal and not haram. So the Day of Ashura happens, Imam is watching. Unfortunately, they did the dhikr at Fajr time. Umar ibn Sa'ad bin Abi Waqqas comes with an arrow. Now he wants to impress Ibn Ziyad. Let me give you a quick historical reference. Umar ibn Sa'ad writes to Ibn Ziyad, who is the governor, and tells him that Hussein ibn Ali is ready to leave for India. I think we should let him go. Because Ibn As, I mean Ibn Sa'ad, knew Imam Hussein's position. And his position is in trouble. Ibn Ziyad reads his letter and says, yeah, he won't threaten us anymore. Maybe it's good. Shimr the Joshan, Shimr. The one who beheaded Imam Hussein alayhi salam was standing next to him. He said, you're going to allow this man who you've captured and trapped, you're going to let him slip by your hands? Look how shaitan whispers. Min sharril waswasil khannas. Whispers. You let him? Come on, get him now. So Ibn Ziyad looks at him and says, yeah. Because what will Yazid think? Yazid will think I'm a coward. And you know, I've got to impress Iblis. I need to show Iblis how evil I am. So you're right. Get his bayah right now. Write that, boom, boom, stamp it, and tells him, if Ibn, Ibn Sa'd becomes weak in any way, you take the command. So when Ibn Sa'd is reading this, he looks at, he has, he looks at Shemr, he says, you're not getting this. This is the jealousy now. You, you want to take over my command? I love this power. I want to be the governor of Ray. I'm not going to let you take it over. You watch how mean I'm going to be. I'm going to be extra mean to convince Iblis, my master, how much I serve him. So Omar ibn Saad comes in the morning and he pulls the arrow. He says, all of you witness, Ana, Omar ibn Saad bin Abi Waqqas is the first one to throw this arrow to begin this war. What a bold move for jihad. You cannot start the war. You have to defend the war. So we know who the kafir is. We know who the kuffar are. And the battle begins. And Imam is watching. From Fajr, it goes on. Abbas comes back and forth. Zuhair ibn Khayn comes back and forth. Hmm? All the companions go. They get killed. Imam is watching. He consoles some of them, as we discussed. It happens back and forth. And in, in Karbala, every age was represented. Every gender. Male, female was represented. All ages were represented. All races were represented. Blacks, whites, yellow, brown. Everybody was there. People of all kinds were representing Imam Hussain alayhi Because Karbala is the template to win. So the battle starts and it goes on. And Imam was so strategic. He was not suicidal. He wanted to defeat the enemy at best. But he was limited. His capacity was limited. So brilliantly, historically, he broke his army into three parts. Abbas in the middle, Zuhair ibn Khayn on one side, and Habib ibn Madahir on the other side. He says, three of us will flank, so the enemy's large size will not attack us from the sides. And that's how the battle took place. From Fajr all the way to Dhuhr. A large army was still intact. Imam Hussein's army was killed, quite a few, but still a large was still intact. A large was left. Show you how strong they must have been. To fight 30,000 soldiers, subhanallah, that's incredible. In the annals of history, to hold 30,000 soldiers with a mere 72 warriors is unprecedented. That's the will of God. But look, it became time of salah. As salah. The Imam says, I can continue to fight, but why are we fighting if not for salah? So he requests Ibn Sa'd, stop this attack. We want to pray. They said, Your prayers are not accepted. They taunt Imam Hussein. Negative, he takes it positive. No problem, Allah says, La yahzunka kufrum, la yahzunka qawluhum, inna al-izzata lillahi jami'an. 
Honor is with Allah. Don't let what they say get you. You stand upright. And Abu Tamama looks at Imam Hussein. He says, how beautiful it would be for us to pray behind you before we become shaheed. Imam looks at Abu Tamama and says, Abu Tamama, how honored we are to have you. May Allah raise you among the most prayerful ones for remembering prayer on this, on this very, very important day. Imam is praying Salatul Khawf and Abu Tamama is praying with him in Salatul Khawf and holding the shield as they're praying. They say so many members of Imam's army were killed by the enemy. Cowards. They were cowards. They couldn't wait for the pious people to finish Salah. But this is how bad they were. They held back water. They held back. They didn't even allow the Imam to finish praying. They were striking, striking. And finally, Imam goes back and fights until everyone is martyred. Abbas is martyred. Ali Akbar is martyred. Everyone is martyred. It's time for the Imam to go. And tonight, we remember him. Tomorrow you will remember him more. He goes to his wives. The enemy is waiting now. They're hitting their horses. Hussein, come out. We're waiting for you. Imam is like, he goes to his wives and bids them goodbye. Rabab. Layla was there. The farwa. He bids goodbye to Imam Muhammad Baqir alayhi Little child who was present. Bids him goodbye. For he's the fifth Imam. He bids goodbye to all his relatives. Then he takes his little daughter Ruqayya. Can you imagine? They say Ruqayya loved her father so much. She used to sleep on his chest every night. When she would sleep at night, she would sleep on his chest. She loves him so much. You know what Imam Hussein says to Rukhaya? He says, my love, I am leaving. What daughter, but she was so wise, so intelligent, four years old, but she understood the gravity. He says, but don't worry, like your grandmother Zahra, Fatima to Zahra, salamu alayhi. The Prophet whispered into her ears, Two things. He said, I am leaving soon and you will join me soon. He says to Rukhaya the same thing. He says, I am leaving. But you will join me very soon, Rukhaya. To tell this four-year-old child this is incredible and profound. He goes to Zainab and of course Rukhaya is holding on to he goes to Zainab and says, Zainab, be strong. Oh, Zainab. You know, Zainab salam, was the female version of Ali ibn Abi Talib. She was the female version. When she spoke, people thought it's Ali ibn Abi Talib talking. That's how Zainab salam, was. Strong, humble, full of wisdom. He bids her goodbye, hugs her and says, sister, be patient. They will drag you city to city. They will try to humiliate you. But be patient. I won't be there to protect you. And don't hurt yourself. Be patient. Maintain your flag. The women were the flag of modesty in Karbala. They were two things, modesty and media. He leaves that authority to Zainab alayhi salam. Then he goes to Imam Zain al And as you know, Imam Zain alayhi salam says, Hal min nasir in yansurun. And a weak voice comes from the tent and says, Labbaik, ya abati labbaik. I respond to you, O oh, Father. You have called, I'm here. Imam Zain al-Abidin was the elder son, but he looked very young. But he was ill in Karbala. He was bedridden. Imam goes towards him and holds him. It says, my son, my time has come for me to go. My time has come for me to go and I relieve this Imamat Ruhul Qudus to you. They say the Imam breathed, whispered into his ears, Ruhul Qudus, left the Imamat to him. They say the Ruhul Qudus opens thousands of doors for they take over the Imamat the way the Prophet left it to Imam Ali alayhi And he says, my son, be patient for much trial will come to you. Much trial will come to you, oh, Ali ibn al Hussein, Zainul Abideen, Zainul Abideen, the beauty of prayer, the beauty of worship. I can't imagine how the 
feeling must have been for the son to look at his father under these conditions, wanting to help his father. But Imam Hussain says, you must not fight for the imamat is with you. Allah will continue this imamat as he promises. And then he puts on his Yemeni clothes. Some historians say, Fatima the Zahra, salamu alayha, stitched it herself. And she gave it to Zainab and said, there will come a time when your brother will be in difficulty. Give him this dress to wear. Let him wear this. It's the Yemeni trousers. Imam says, give me those Yemeni trousers. Historians say that Imam Hussain alayhi salam took his clothes and tore it. Started tearing it. And the reason he did that, he says, I want to devalue this dress. Lest they take it from me and leave me without clothes. <laughs> they say when he bought the land from the Banu Asad, he said, tomorrow, soon, a great event will take place. You will see bodies left unburied. Please bury us for the enemy will not do it. Imam said to them, he says, and if you don't have the time, then bring your children to play and take the sand and throw it over our bodies because this enemy will not do that for us. He tears his trousers and he gets on his horse and the enemy is eager. The Lion of Allah is now being waited for. And the enemy was waiting to get his body, to get his head, so they could go claim the money. And Imam Hussain alayhi salam gets on his horse, bids everybody goodbye. But his horse is not moving. He looks below, he sees his daughter, Rukhaya is still holding his mama. Wait. <laughs> he gets off his horse again and hugs her. Bids her goodbye. They say Ruqayya cried every night. She could not bear the separation from her father until she died. <laughs> what father can ride on a horse? Tell me and leave this beautiful daughter behind. <laughs> what father can go and say, Ya Allah, I'm going towards you. But I've loved this daughter of mine. Allah says, don't worry. Have tawakkal al Allah. They are from me, I will protect them. And if they die, I will raise them very high. So as the Imam approaches the enemy, they're all running away. He comes near them, they're afraid. All the cowards, all cowards running around. Imam goes around like moving his sword. The cowards, they're all scared. Imam says, come, you've come for me, haven't you? This is Ali ibn Abi Talib now. His shujaat, his ability to fight was like his father, taught by his father. And he was a master of fighting. Historians say Imam starts striking and hitting and killing. And he was so agile. The enemies knew that if Imam fought one on one, he would kill and kill and kill. But historians say Hamid ibn Muslim was present. Imam, by the way, brought some historians on the sidelines to write what happened. This is why we have some of these messages. Imam is fighting and then they circle him. They circle him and they start showering him with arrows. So many arrows were going towards him. And the women are saying, looking this way and saying, Ya Allah, they were on a hill looking down. Zainab is looking, the wives are looking. This lion is going back and forth. But what was he reciting? You know what was he reciting? Imam Hussain alayhi salam was a walking, talking Quran. As he's fighting, he says, Am hasibta anna ashab al-kahfi wal-raqib kanu min ayatina ajma. I have you not taken account of the ashab al-kahf? How amazing was them and their inscription? How we preserved them? Imam is telling them, I'm going to win. Even if he killed me, my message is like the message of Ashab al Kaf. We will watch you wither away, oh you Bani Umayyah. We will win this, and I will never bow to you. And they shower him so much. 
They come close to his horse. He can't even move his horse. And they jump on him. And they strike him so much. That he falls to the ground. Now he's down. Arrows are everywhere on his body. They're all eager to kill him. He can't move. He's immobilized. His horse is standing. He's on the ground. His sword is, can't move. Each one wants to go get his head. Because that's the boot. That's the loot. That's the one that's going to be paid the most. So they turn him around. <laughs> and this the Imam is looking. He's doing dua. He's doing salah. He's waiting for that moment. He loves this moment. He wants it like his father. Enemies jump on him. They see the Prophet's face. They get off. They say, we can't kill him. Oh my God. Light is from his face. How can we kill such a man? How can we kill such a man? He says, I'll do it. He was ruthless, cold, like a crocodile, spineless. And he gets on the chest of Imam Hussain. <laughs> and he removes the head from the body. Allah <laughs> Come back, oh you whose soul is well pleased, come back. Imam Zainul Abidin hears this noise and he opens up the tent. He says, Allah kad khutil al Hussein ubi Karbala. Allah kad dhubi al Hussein ubi Karbala. He sees his father's head on the spear. <clears throat> And then they were not happy to kill him. They come and tear his clothes. They tried to get the ring off his finger, but it wasn't coming off, so they cut it. <laughs> Historians say that they were not happy even then. So they brought horses. Even Saad said, trample his body and crush it. Because he didn't give us bayah, that anger. Allah says, Mood to be ghaidikum, wait. And he, the companions in the tent heard the, the crack, cracking voices of the bones as the horses are crushing. This is our blessed Imam Hussein, my respected sisters and brothers. The pain and the struggle for the truth is priceless. Let him live in our hearts forever. For our blessed Imam has given the greatest sacrifice in history. Let us be real, Hussein. Ya la la anatu Allah al qawm al dalimin. Wa sayyamu al ladin dalamu ayyamun qalabin yan qaribun. Sallallahu alayka ya ba Abdullah. صلى الله عليك يا ابن رسول الله صلى الله عليك يا حسين ابن علي السلام عليك يا أبا عبد الله وعلى الأرواح التي حلت بفنائك عليك مني سلام الله أبدا ما بقيت وبقي الليل والنهار ولا جعل الله آخر العهد مني لزيارتكم جميعا السلام على الحسين وعلى علي بن الحسين وعلى أولاد الحسين وعلى أصحاب الحسين خصوصا سيدي ومولاه يا بن فضل العباس 
واختك زينب وبنتك يا رقية جميعا شهداء كربلاء ورحمة الله وبركاته اللهم كن لوليك الحجة ابن الحسن صلواتك عليه وعلى آبائه في هذه الساعة وفي كل ساعة وليا محافظا وقائدا وناصرا ودليلا وعينا حتى تسكنه أرضك توعا وتمتعه فيها طويلا برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين three times أما يجيب أما يجيب مضطر إذا دعا ويكشف السوء أما يجيب مضطر إذا دعا ويكشف السوء أما مضطر إذا دعا ويكشف السوء برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين صلوات الله محمد وعلى محمد مصلي على محمد وعلى My respected sisters and brothers May Allah bless you for this blessed night I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us success I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us health to grant us a cure to grant us tranquility to grant peace and tranquility to those who are in need of prayer Inshallah we have a reciter who's going to recite Latmiyat. Let's join, as you know, Latmiyat. What we recite, it's to invoke that spirit of sadness within us. And may Allah give us the strength to continue to do it. Salawat ala Muhammad wa al Muhammad. Salawat ala Muhammad.